So uh, let's get started with uh, since we have a couple of short talks. I want to make sure Alexis gets his maximum amount of time. I first yeah. ran into him. We we boarded a one of these Linux Foundation buses to one of the events, and we happened to be sitting next to each other. And we had this very long conversation about GPL and licensing, and little did I know he was going to become the guy inside Intel who was yeah. thinking about these questions. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and so there I, are lots I'm, of guys inside Intel. <laughs> yes, but, but you're, you're, you're the guy who's you're the guy who gets it most, yeah. I would say. So but you won't say that, but I will. Yeah. So I'm really excited to hear him talk about about how they deal with their license understanding and compliance inside uh, inside Intel. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks again, Thomas, Bradley, everyone, <laughs> all for organizing this wonderful legal level. Um, third year running. The title of the talk is Sisyphus is Happy, and I assume you know the Sisyphus myth. I'm Greek, so I'm, I'm using two myths. <laughs> Like that. So Sisyphus was the poor guy who was pushing a stone uh, way up in the mountain and when it reached the top the uh, boulder still rolled down again and he had to do it again and again and again. And this is an apt metaphor for the work that we're doing in software legal compliance, <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> so, but we're happy. And yeah. So this is about uh, lessons that we learned while trying to do this stuff. Um, I was about to say, I'm Alexis Avras. Um, yeah, people know me as ZVR since that was my first login name in the first Unix machine I used in '83. So I've been doing uh, open source and free software for 30 something years, 30 years before they were called like, like that. <laughs> um, and uh, I mention this because I will be uh, giving some historical perspective in all those things uh, uh, during my talk. A couple of disclaimers: I'm definitely not a lawyer, right? So my PhD is in compilers, so definitely not legal stuff. Uh, maybe it helps me parse legal uh, documents and yeah, <laughs> licenses. Um, so anything that I say here is not legal advice, and yeah, please <laughs> talk to the right people about that. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I work at in Intel, uh, which is a very large company, as you probably have heard of them. And actually, I'm not working in the US office, but I work in this wonderful campus, which is outside Munich. Um, this is the headquarters of Intel Mobile Communications, and we're the part of Intel that does, uh, you know, mobile phones and tablets and stuff like that. And we sell them to our customers. Uh, um, yeah, so Intel Mobile Communication is a separate company from Intel, so it's a wholly owned subsidiary if you want the legal terms, which brings even more fun to the game, as you'll see afterwards. But uh, yeah, we're still called Intel. So uh, when I joined uh, Intel Mobile, um, my official title was Open Source Officer, whatever that means. It basically meant that I was the guy to ask for anything op having to do with open source. And uh, this uh, includes all the questions about licensing, and it also includes all training all the employees about what's open source and licensing thing and stuff like that. And I've been doing lots of that. And this has evolved to something that we call software legal compliance, and the acronym have happy people named it SWLC. Uh, so software legal compliance is the whole thing of trying to be legally compliant with the licenses. As you probably know, software is mostly. Uh, it's not sold, it's licensed, and it's uh, the terms and the conditions of the, uh, that the author gives you are written down in a document which we call the license. So the license actually says what you can do with any piece of software and wh what you must do with any piece of software. And in order to be legally compliant, you have to adhere to all these um, uh, stipulations. So, um, and software legal compliance is interesting, obviously, to companies, because companies want to be legally compliant with whatever they do. Uh, uh, but it's also interesting to developers. And this is 
not only developers working inside the company, we will put them in the company box for this one, but uh, definitely individual developers uh, who work on software and more importantly, open source software. And I'll be talking about both of these categories. So let's start with companies. Companies are interested. Okay, the cynical among us will say that companies are only interested in profit, so they don't really care, but legal compliance. Um, As a means to profit. Yeah, it's a prerequisite if you want or something like that. Um, that's why we put the word legal in there, if it's, it gives more importance to the thing. Um, companies definitely worry about their reputation. And, and unfortunately, we all know that license non-compliance does not make you know, front page news. So you will never see this stuff uh, as a front page in a newspaper. Right. This is fake. Right. And it's not today. Right. Uh, but yeah. OK. Uh, I gotta write this down for later press releases. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I didn't name you by name. In the yeah, in a city. Yes. In a city, a mega corp was like that. Anyway, on the other hand, there are things that are um, really hurt some companies. For example, things like that, right? Uh, which gives company uh, not a very nice name if you have. Mr. Paulman holding up a placard, don't buy from ATI. Uh, so companies, besides all the legal stuff, they really care about their reputation. Well, okay, most companies, the companies starting with NV, which do not, but yeah. Okay, I'm not talking about I like this. how his beard hangs over the sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's nice. <laughs> do you know what occasion that was? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do developers, individual developers, care about all this legal compliance? Well, if we take the long historical view on this one, uh, uh, they used to, or yeah, <laughs> in the beginning, or you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, people were really paying attention to uh, licenses. At least that was. Uh, our impressions from the trenches <laughs> that we were looking. Um, uh, but we had this discussion uh, yesterday in the hallway. Um, maybe it was b b uh, because at that point of time, most of the, uh, the us developers were jailed down, locked down in proprietary environments. Okay. Uh, most of us were using some proprietary version of Unix, or the, uh, the uh, happy, lucky few were using the BSD one. Um, but everybody else was using proprietary stuff, different proprietary Unixes all around, um, which were not compatible with each other. Uh, everyone had their own proprietary tools that you couldn't do anything about it. And then, you know, uh, the new project came along, and we've suddenly started to have same tools all over, nice tools, very well written, uh, even better than the one uh, that were available with the system. And then, you know, GCC came along, well, you, you had a compiler for each thing. Yeah. And at that point, people were really paying attention to, uh, you know, this software is under GPL, or this software is BSD. And you know uh, the evolution of BSD four close to three close to two close that meant something. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, moving forward towards today, uh, we are what has been called post open source. Okay. I don't know. Have you ever heard this term? It started a couple of years ago from this tweet. That said that yeah, all the young developers are now post open source, fat license governments, just commit to GitHub. I just want to have my, my code out there. Also yeah. known as no company can use this software. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this yeah. Starts a whole through 
slew of other problems and yeah, uh, Richard has written, uh, Richard Fernanda has written a nice blog about it in the open source blog. Uh, this disregard of licenses is not something that you can get away very easily. And that's basically because from what we found out, and now I'm talking more about the experience, uh, uh, seeing different uh, pieces of software, and definitely the software that we're using uh, at, in, in Intel. Okay, um, every software that we, we have seen is a combination, right? Nothing is written, well, okay, besides some very small things uh, that are written completely from scratch and completely independently, all the software is a combination. And it's a combination of the software that you write your own and software that you get from others. Right. And when you're in uh, a commercial environment that, uh, like uh, we are, it's the software that you write, that uh, you write yourself, and the software that others wrote, and this is either open source software, free and open source software, uh, or proprietary software. Most of our software within Intel is a sum of all these three. Right. Uh, when we're talking about an open source project, obviously the proprietary part is missing, but again, it's something that you own, that you write on your own, and something that uh, came from other uh, open source uh, sources. And remember, software legal compliance is, you have to be legally compliant with all the licenses of the software. Right, and if the, the software is a combination, you have different licenses for each part, and you have to be legally compliant with each one of them. Right. In order to be legally compliant, you have to know what's in there, and you have to know exactly all the licenses for, for each piece of software. Right. Um, this is a big problem because nobody really knows what's inside any piece of software. Definitely not inside the commercial environment that <laughs> I'm working in. Um, if you ask somebody what is inside this piece of software, the answer that you'll get is yeah, an approximation of the truth. It's not really <laughs> the truth. Okay. There are many efforts uh, underway in order to find out uh, and declare what is the content of the uh, software. Uh, you, may, you may have heard of SPDX, which is a, a description of uh, what this is the software and the license and the copyright holders. Um, until now, for us at least, SPDX was unusable. Uh, there are uh, efforts underway to get the SPDX 2.0 version, which will be hierarchical, and this might be useful for us. But in any way, when you try to find out what is inside a piece of software, because you don't have an accurate description, you play in detective. Right. Uh, so you look at the software, and you try to find out um, the different pieces that uh, comprise this whole thing. And what we're actually thinking of uh, calling it inside uh, our group in Intel is to we can, uh, <coughs> we can produce a TV show called CSI Licenses, <laughs> right, where we try to find out what is there. Uh, let me run through a couple of examples. Completely open source stuff. Okay, I'm not going to be mention, even mentioning proprietary, which is, yeah. <laughs> might be even worse. Um, so Jeffrey Chart, I don't know if you know it, it's a library in Java uh, to create charts. Very nice library, and it comes under license under LGPL 2.1 or later. Right. And so if you think that you know what your software, and you say, hey, my software is using Jeffrey Chart, in your list of IP content or IP plan, whatever you want to call it, you will put JFE chart under this license. Unfortunately, when you look at a GP, uh, you can, when you look at the source of JFE chart uh, in there, you realize that it includes JUnit, and JUnit is under a different license, which is under the Eclipse public license, which might or might not affect you, but you definitely have to list it somewhere. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Let's run through another one. You know curl, I suppose. It's a library for getting HTTP connections and getting the output. All the website and every uh, document inside 
the website and the source code says, Carolyn need carry a license under MIT X derivative license. And when you talk to people who know licenses, they understand what is uh, MIT X license. Uh, uh, and they understand what they have to do and then what they can do. Unfortunately, once again, when you look at the core, when you look at the source of the kernel, you find two files, MD4 and MD5.c, which have a license from RSA Data Security, which might people might think that this is an advertising clause. Well, depending on the legal paper that you're going to ask, say that, yeah, you have to identify that this is RSA message JS algorithm in all material referencing this software function. Right. So, yeah, you might be using curl and you say, hey, curl is another MIT, but somewhere deep inside, something is there that might not be pure MIT. Okay. Last quick example, Hyperf2 was, a, it's been replaced now by Hyperf3, but Hyperf2 was a software that was doing uh, network performance statistics. Um, and it prominently claims that it's under the University of Illinois license, which is a three close BSD, and people understand what three close BSD is. Once again, when you dive and you see it in the code, you see that it includes gnu-getops.ca.h, getops which are definitely licensed under LGPL version 2 or later. Again, this does not really help having a software which we call its three closed BSD and includes LGBL. Right. This was a very uh, common. Um, Alex, you still take questions now or wait? Yeah, sure. Alex, is, have you yeah. ever had it where someone is giving a talk and they mention something on a slide about a problem with licensing and you check your own code base and you find that exact problem? Has Oops. that ever happened to you? Uh, <laughs> no. No, okay. Just, just, just wondered. No, no reason. come on. No, no, no reason. No reason. No reason. Entirely yeah. hypothetical question. Yes. Of course. <laughs> okay. No, I don't suppose it ever happened. This ever happened. happened. No, no. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been recorded. For <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was completely hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this used to be a case. Lots GitOp is <laughs> a known offender because, again, back in the history when the GNU project appeared, this code was very useful, and GitOp everybody wanted it and just copied from the uh, GNU sources and put it in many many projects which were not really supposed to be GPL or LGPL or anything. Right. Um, things are getting better, much better, because basically everybody assumes that GitOpt is available. Right. Uh, and we say, OK, we don't include the source code. We will use it from uh, the library, which I know that nowadays includes GitOpt. Right. Um, it's not always uh, that great. So I'm not going to name the project, but it's a project which is under Apache license. It's an Android port of another utility. Um, so it's a user space uh, uh, program. Uh, since it's going to be running on Android, they chose the Apache license. Uh, the original uh, version was, I think, uh, BSD. Anyway, uh, but. Uh, and they say, hey, here is your uh, Apache licensed user program running on Android. And then you look at the goal again, you know what, where this is going, right? And they have this wonderful if the Android, and the Android C -Live does not have get line, so I just copy it from BusyBox. And I include it there. What possibly could go wrong? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Right. And they have an exact copy of git line, which BusyBox includes. However, BusyBox is definitely not under Apache. So yeah. So you have all these problems for code that you copy from the internet. And what we usually refer to in our group, the curse of copy-paste. Right. So because you find some more code, you copy, and you paste it, and yeah, 
doesn't at, have to. At least you had the luxury in that case of someone putting a comment about where they got it from. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just to be clear, I don't need to go write you a letter about that. Busybox thing, right? That's Sorry? all resolved. I don't have to write you a letter about that busy box thing or anything. Um, yeah, it's uh, not a Taurus Apache thing that includes code by BusyBox. You maybe maybe we can give you the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is, is, is that software that Intel is shipping? Uh, not after we've discovered this one. Oh, well, there well, you go, then you'd have yeah. to write him a letter. <laughs> 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 well, actually, yeah, we might be shipping, but we'll name it GPL. So, yeah. <laughs> At least we know what's happening. So, anyway. You definitely have to have something in the corporate world called strategy and about how do you handle open source and my company being very big in all organization things, we have processes and we follow for workflows of how you do all this stuff. Don't be alarmed by that and don't be afraid, it doesn't have to be complicated. Okay, you can have it as simple as you want and yeah. It might be just ask a guy who really knows. Yeah, sure. yeah, good. Four thirty-one. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated. And by complicated, I can give an example of a solution that was proposed that says yes, the different steps for introducing code will be something like scan, identify, audit, the resolution of this, any issue, then the review, and you get approval, then you register the solution, and then you have distribution and verification, and all this stuff. And everything involves uh, uh, people with different roles, like developer, architect, developer manager, compliance stuff, legal counsel who are going to be asked. Yeah, doesn't matter. You don't have to do this, and actually I don't think yeah, such a setup is useful in any case. Uh, even for us, which are <laughs> we're a huge company. Basically, we have you have to have the process, but it has to be as simple as possible, and and um, it's going to be based on trust, right? At some point, you have to trust your developers, and there's no way you can um, replace the trust that you give to your developers with legal measures that you have to. Uh, you know, uh, in order to supervise them and make sure that all uh, legal compliance is taken care of. So you have to talk to the developer. Of course, you have to educate them first in order to understand all these problems. Right? Uh, otherwise, you can't expect anything. Uh, yeah. And the whole process should not be legal oriented. Right? Again, we have seen things that legal wants to try and drive the whole uh, process. And this really doesn't work. I mean, the goal of the, so uh, the goal of the company is to produce products, right? And it's not to satisfy all uh, uh, legal requirements for the sake of uh, the requirements, right? And it's not our job to always pose uh, you know, obstacles that have to be uh, overcome. You have to, uh, in the end, produce a product. So let me finish by a couple of slides of the instructions I'm we're giving to developers, how to handle external source. And this is something that I believe should be known and should be taught at whenever yeah, someone gets, uh, learns how to code and learns how to copy paste code from other ways, from other sources. OK, so it's basically a do's and don'ts. OK, and the don'ts are pretty easy. I mean, don't use code if you don't have a license. You have to have a license, right? especially for us who are using proprietary code uh, in our products. We definitely have to have a license. Right? Don't assume that because you don't see a copyright line attribution in the beginning, it doesn't. You don't need uh, to get a license. You always have to. We listened before. Right. Don't assume or guess the license. We have to be pretty sure what the license is exactly. Right. And don't ever remove copyright notices because it makes our job so much harder to find out uh, where the code is coming from. Right. And the do's and evers. Simpler. Um, do add your own copyright when you touch code. So at <coughs> least we can keep track of what has been changed and who has touched this code. Right. 
and do get a license to any external code. We keep telling them, right? Uh, anything that you download, anything that you find online, anything that you find in books and you copy, everything you have to have a license, right? And having yeah, all these do's and don'ts, okay, it makes our job for software legal compliance much easier, and it's much faster for anyone. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, for, uh, for coding textbooks, uh, right. uh, for computer science textbooks, how big must the code be for uh, having a license? Because I think there are so much merge sort and quick sort implementations out there in any textbook, and uh, it's more like textbooks don't really have a practical case, but I think it is. Uh, how do you handle it? You, can, you, uh, you can't write every author, so, oh yeah, you are a quick, so I want to copy and modify it and fit into my use case. Uh, right, so, yeah. This is definitely a legal question, and a legal person should, should be given <laughs> the right answer. As far as I know, the copyright law does not have a limit, so it doesn't say that, hey, you can copy it as long as it's less than 10 lines of code or something, right? And there is no thing like relative limits, but I only took 10 lines out of this thousand line program, or I only take 10 lines in my million line program. It's everywhere a copy, right? And so basically in, um, in our setup, we tell them everything is copyrighted, unless it's really obvious, like I equals zero, Right, uh, or a semicolon, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can copy a semicolon, but you cannot copy much more than that, right? You, uh, there's no uh, rule that says, I mean, we're not using a rule that says you can only copy this part. I think we have time for copy. one more question. Yes. Do you want to in the to, to, to do the verification? Oh, we, we use the other, everything. Other than, other than graph, which is obvious. Yeah, oh, we're using everything that is out there. We definitely use Phosology. We are investor in Black Duck. We're using Black Duck. We're using Palavida. We're using every. We're using our own scripts. Everything uh, doing. Yeah. Sorry. We're using everything commercial. Everything open source. We're using everything. Yes. We need all the help that we can get. Right. The thing is. If you are on file level, even Phosology does all the work that you want to do. If you really want to find all the snippets, like the one I show, just someone copied get line on the, the lines, then yeah, you need it on file. Well, thank you very much, Alexios.